Or good afternoon, and I'd like to bring the regular afternoon meeting of Township Atlanta Council to order. And uh, the uh, first item is uh, A1, the uh, regular afternoon council meeting agenda. Now, before I ask for a motion to accept, there are three delegations which have withdrawn, and that's E2, Mr. Seitz, E3, Ms. DeRoche, E4, Mr. Fisher, and one addition, E5, Mr. Colin Fry. So with that... Colin is addition, is an addition, and there's withdrawals E2, E3, E4 are withdrawn with an addition of E5, Mr. Fry. So with that, I would call for motion, Councillor Long, seconded by Councillor Davis. All those in favour, opposed and carried. Now I ask for a motion to adopt the minutes of the regular afternoon council meeting of July the 9th. So Councillor Fox, seconder. Councillor Arneson, any errors or omissions? All those in favour, opposed and carried. Are there any on-table items? Okay, on, I mean on table. Um, I'll, I'll get to that. Okay, so a motion to resolve and special close for the items on the agenda, and uh, I would ask that uh, council allow uh, consideration uh, of um, amending the agenda once we're into close to allow for others uh, who will be visiting or, or guests to join the meeting and accommodate their schedules. So with that, I'll ask for a motion. Councilor Qualley, seconded by Councilor Arneson, and Councilor. Do you want to push your button, Councillor Fox? Do you have something to add? I have a okay. property. Councillor Fox, uh, property. property. Okay. Okay, with that, I'll ask the question. All those in favor? Opposed and carried. So now I'll resolve the special close. Thank you. In the regular meeting of, F of the uh, Township Alani Council, and uh, the uh, next item on the agenda is uh, presentations and we have uh, Ms. Barb Sharp, Chair of the Community Input Group Task Force and uh, she'll present on the findings of the task force. Uh, welcome here. It's here. Okay. Oh, there we go. When do I hit to start it here? This one? Kind of an odd. Oh, there we go. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. I just use these down arrows, right? Well, good afternoon, good evening, Your Worship and Council. Thank you very much for allowing me to come and make a presentation on behalf of uh, the uh, task force that. Uh, you're all quite familiar with and intimate with probably most of the details of those meetings, but it's nice to come forward in the public arena and just show the uh, the work that's been done on this. So um, I'll begin by saying that uh, we, you, as you know yourselves, I'm, but I'm not doing it just for you, of course. Um, the uh, task force was uh, agreed to by council as under motion on March 19th of this year. It kind of followed from, of course, the public engagement, uh, the Mayor's uh, Standing Committee on Public Engagement, to keep that flow of uh, what I call the input, pin, input and feedback loop uh, ongoing so that uh, the input was heard from the public, the feedback, and uh, that's kind of how we got into the, um, the task force because the, the citizens of Langley came together with a whole bunch of groups in the community, the, the Brookswood, the Fort Langley, all the different various members. And it seemed like a super good idea to bring them all together with some of the business community and others to, you know, talk about important issues. And so the council did that and established the task force. I think it was 26 members on the task force, including members of council. And uh, we also had a facilitator to help us, uh, Mr. Gordon McIntosh. And what he did was he set out uh, pre-meeting information to all of us to get, you know, to start really get our brains engaging and thinking about uh, what we wanted to talk about at the three meetings that were established at the end of April, May and June of this year. Oh, these something. <laughs> Um, and what we uh, came to at our first meeting was a vision statement that had been uh, put together by uh, Gord to get us going, to thinking about the things that we were going to talk about in forms of mostly 
what I call small breakout groups and council and various members of the committee sat together and went over what were like the key vision checklists, the economy, the environmental, the infrastructure, the social, and of course, um, you know, the, uh, the, the governance and stuff. So we, um, we had these small breakout groups and you can see a lot of activity going on here, uh, papers everywhere. And thank goodness for staff members that were there to help record some of the details and uh, take it away. And uh, Doreen made a wonderful job of pulling everything together at the end between her and Gord. They did a fabulous job of that. And each um, time before our next meeting, we had all of the details from the previous meetings that we had put together. So the three months of work, uh, everybody worked really hard to bring all those issues together. Uh, and I do want to emphasize here, there were many, many more priorities than just the few that finally came to council. The list is endless. Um, the list is to limit sometimes, but we, we agreed upon the uh, vision statements. And you can see human aesthetics, natural area, business retention, growth, community image, tourism, arts, culture, healthy lifestyles. I mean, there wasn't any stone left unturned with this group uh, of uh, community people. So we... Um, we use the factors uh, such as success indicators, expectations, what's working well, what needs attention. So, you know, whether we have good greenways and what we can do to improve them. We, uh, as an example, for the economy itself, which is job creation, business retention, community image, tourism, et cetera, we had 33 in total success indicators. I've only listed just a few there. Things like we have a thriving film industry, we have local jobs, we anticipate and prepare for future needs like alternative energy. And we also used um, what works well, uh, the horse industry, uh, community special events, airport, and then we had areas of attention. And this is just the economy. It's not all the other factors that we looked at. Live workspaces, attracting new business, filming in the ALR, some of the areas for attention that we could use. So you can see a few more smiling faces after we uh, got a little bit further along into our process as people got to be more comfortable with each other and uh, got to work a lot harder. We got through some really tough uh, discussions because you can imagine people are not always of agreement. So it's important to really, uh, really realize that the task force dealt with a tremendous amount of issues, and I know Council's intimately aware of those, and by no means does the group prioritizing limit or minimize any of the other issues that were brought forward that are in the final report. So all the issues are listed for any member of the community to see how detailed this group was so that you, you can see yourself that there wasn't anything, any stone unturned. We simply ran out of time to address more issues and finalize and get, you know, sort of mined down on some of those issues. So if you look at April, the, the intensity, and then you look at June, you can see that it's a little more relaxed because we've gotten to really work so hard together and be able to... Uh, get a lot done. We did get a lot done in those three months. So key to the task force recommendations, this is the beginning, not the end. Okay. Mayor and council continue to actively participate in the input and feedback loops from the community. And the fact that the mayor and council members were present in both body and mind speaks volumes about the commitment that this mayor and council have towards their community. So we really appreciate that. And, um, I want to say thank you from the task force. Uh, we'd like to once again say thank you and keep going in this ongoing feedback loop between the members of the community and the mayor and council. Without the vision that this mayor and council have had, we, you'd be losing out, we'd be losing out on all the important things that this group of people brought forward for everybody to discuss. So we also want to thank the facilitator. I did actually get a picture of him working hard there, uh, Gord McIntosh, uh, for keeping us on track. That's what he was really doing. My job was the easiest. I just opened the meeting, closed the meeting, you know, get to be friendly with everybody, so as the chair. But this is the real hardcore, the staff the, and the members of the com committee and, and Gord working hard to pull all the issues together. So it's a complicated process, and we're looking forward to many more opportunities like this in the future. So uh, on behalf of all of us, I just want to say thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, okay. and thanks and thanks for uh, taking on the difficult job of keeping us all in line as chair. Oh, hardly. Uh, that was tough, I know. So I have some uh, questions, uh, sure. comments from okay. council. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Richter. 
Yeah, and thank you very much, uh, Barb, for coming out and, and telling us all about this. It, it was a very, very interesting and interactive process. Very and I thought interactive. The participation was outstanding. Uh, although I, I did appreciate the comment that you made with regards to the the list of ideas, there oh. were there were like over fifty. Uh, well, the issue areas. Well, generated? like the successes, you could see 33 alone there. Like each group had tremendous I, amounts of things attached I know, to but it. The big thing is that the, the group as a whole oh, yeah. group generated a list of 50 plus yep. issues. And, but we were only able to get through 20 something. Yeah, I know. Like... So I guess the question I have for you is the, the whole list of 50 yep. going to go to the next council because they should be able to see I think they should. the full range. Absolutely. And, I, I, yeah. That's my understanding is that all of it, you'll see what we worked on and finalized and got down to uh, mine down on some of the issues. And then there's the outstanding ones we didn't get time to deal with in the three meetings. And those should also be dealt with in the same way. Basically, the groups were just told to go pick whichever one you want to work on. At the beginning, on. yeah. Yeah, so, there was yeah. no prioritization. Yeah, not in that sense. Yeah. So I yeah. think they're all, that's why I say there's equally like all this host of issues there and I'm sure um, I certainly would be and I'm sure most of the committee members would be happy if you wanted us to take another meeting or whatever at some point in the future and and do some more mining on some of those other issues we'd be happy to do that with of course your participation <laughs> Thank you. Okay. D just to clarify, I think there was some prioritization in the first meeting. I know Council Richter wasn't wasn't able to make the first meeting. Yeah, so some of the, some, that's how we, we did, got to the got list. To we got there to. was a prioritization by yeah. the by the groups and what was I, important to them. I'm referring to the list of fifty yeah. odd items. Yeah, yeah. The ones there was no prioritization on that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah we, yeah. we yeah. did prioritize, and that was in the second meeting. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just saying that you you know you weren't able to make every meeting. So, Councillor Fox. No, I just wanted to say. As the mover of the original motion, thanks for your leadership, and uh, I appreciate the leadership that you provided. You might you kind of you know made it pretty simplistic, simplistic, but you were to, did take a strong leadership role, and I appreciate that. And thanks for all the work and effort you put into the committee. Did outstanding, and council. It's just I I this is just you guys are uh, leaders in Metro Vancouver, in my opinion. So I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor okay. Arneson. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to echo those comments. I was able to make two of the sessions. And what I found really interesting about it is that as you were reflecting, that once a group kind of comes together and you get used to each other in a way, yep. but then you also mix it up because you have the topic areas and people moving around, it really is interesting to see ideas coalesce and come forward. And then the way that we put them together, I think it's going to be a very useful framework. So I'm really uh, happy to have been able to participate, and I know that uh, the incoming council will use yeah, that as a framework fall, for yeah, all the priorities. So thank you very much. Thanks. Yep. Thank you, and I don't see any further uh, comments. I just want to say thank you, especially to uh, the members of the community that took time yeah. out of their busy schedules to come out and uh, spend time with us and provide the valu valuable input. And I know there's some uh, members of the committee that are here tonight. I don't know if they can all stand and wave. And yeah, stand and wave, everybody yeah. that's here. Who's yeah, on the on. committee? Wave. Or just wave. <laughs> they can't stand. <laughs> I guess they've done enough. Just yeah. by saying, I'm too tired. From it's all hot. Day. It's a hot day. Yeah, that's right. But we do appreciate it. Really uh, want to make sure that that's, that's uh, I know council appreciates the fact that we can't do this alone. And we do okay. need members of the community to come out and, and provide their input. So thank you. Okay. And uh, Council, council Rector has one more thing. Uh, yeah, just uh, one question. Uh, so the work that the committee's done that's come to council, uh, any of the new people that are running for council uh, this fall, can they access that report just by contacting the mayor's office? Yeah, I would think public. it's public information. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. the report's out. Yeah. So yeah. all they have to do is just I think yeah. contact yeah. the township. Yeah. So they can have access. I don't know. Is it on the is it on is it on the is it on the uh, website? website somewhere? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah uh, probably. It's on the agenda from certain meetings. Do we have it on the yeah. website? We had. Did the report come to council? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It'll be available. There's no problem. Yeah, it's a public I'm document. Sure. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate okay. it. Okay. Good. Thank you guys. Thank you. Okay. Next, uh, uh, we go to delegations. Uh, there, are just for information for those that are here, uh, three delegations have withdrawn. That's uh, delegations in E2, Casper Sites, uh, E3, Patricia Des, Des Rocher, and E4, J Jeff Fisher. One has been added, Mr. Colin Fry. So we'll start with E1, uh, Graham Farstad, and come forward. And you do have five minutes to present, and you'll see a solid red light when your five minutes is up. So on that little, welcome here. 
No, she, no, they'll help you over there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. oh, okay. Yeah. Do, what, do you need some assistance in getting your... Oh, there you go. There okay. yeah, we'll help you get up. Yeah. Come on, oh, Thanks very much, Your Worship, members of council. Uh, my name is Graham Farstad, land use planner and principal with the Arlington Group, Planning and Architecture. I'm speaking in uh, support of the application for a soil deposit proposal at 23433 44th Avenue. And I just have 10 slides to just cover the highlights of the application. The proposal is permanent disposition and placement of clean fill on a 2.3 hectare site, 5.68 acres. Next. The, uh, there's a picture of the site. The yellow area surrounds the site. The, um, the axis is off 44th. Um, the proposal is basically to shape the slope and make the site more usable. The slight site uh, rises up north of 44th and then drops down farther north. And previously there had been a, an equestrian use. There's a, a bit of a topographic break at the top and the, the applicants simply want to make the site more usable to bring back the equestrian use that was there previously. The uh, site is, is quite large and we propose to comply with all grading, setback and environmental requirements of the soil removal and deposit bylaw. The site is not in the ALR and it is quite a unique site uh, in terms of some of its characteristics. One of the aspects that is unique to the site is that we're looking at clean fill from only one location, soil that was excavated for the Evergreen Skytrain extension. That has been temporarily stockpiled in Port Coquillum on a site owned by the applicant. And the proposal is to uh, confirm that that clean fill uh, would be the only site that would be used. So we have already had that certified by Aquaterra consultants and would like to simply find a permanent location for that. The applicant owns both the stockpiled and the disposal sites and is not going to permit any soil from any other sites without the prior written approval of the Township of Langley. All ESC requirements of the Township will be met. The site actually has a very safe access from the Fraser Highway. There's a couple of possibilities. We could use 44th, but I think it's probably superior if we use a, an access only from the Fraser Highway, right turn inbound, as you see on the red arrow, and around the three uh, ha green noted sites are owned by the applicant. So the site uh, access would come to the east side, across 44th to the proposed disposition site. There would only be one property east of the uh, applicant's property uh, that, uh, and in fact that property has a 70 to 80 meter buffer of treed buffer. So we can have a very uh, ideal situation uh, in terms of minimizing uh, access uh, uh, impacts on any other property. In terms of traffic, the very low traffic movements with very limited hours, the applicant typically would use one truck, but there would be a maximum of two trucks owned by the applicant that would access the site, which would work out to somewhere between four and eight loads per day. The source material would only come from the applicant, and the site would not be available for any other soil sources to ensure quality control. On-site management, um, this is a, a picture of the site turned on its side. The access, uh, as you can see, uh, the, the hatched area would be uh, allow for turn, full turning movements around and disposal within the circle, and then it would be graded and moved to the site. You can see those lines, they show, uh, they drop uh, uh, on a gentle grade towards the north. The, uh, there would be a, two, two fences that would uh, control the sediment as you move north. And uh, so the disposal would be on the area that would be grading to the north. The next picture shows uh, the area where the disposal would take place within that darker area. The typical grades would be um, 
Somewhere between 4 minimum and 9% average grade would be only 7%. So it's quite, uh, quite shallow and there would be a minimum 5 to 1 grades along the edge. So we would not be impacting other properties. Uh, we had a consultation process which resulted in close to 70%, 67.3% to be exact. Um, if you were to count the, t the total number of people notified, there were 764 and only 6.5% of those notified indicated opposition. But if you look at just those that, uh, that commented yes or no, it's over two-thirds. Uh, the properties owned by uh, Amrick and Bellwinder Bath, Engineering design and ESC requirements uh, and, in and engineering and will meet the environmental requirements as well. The um, property owners have had this property for 15 years. We would only, the, 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 the key factors, only certified clean field from, uh, fill from the single site owned by the applicant, safe transportation with uh, low tr volumes, truck routes only would be used, uh, designated by the township careful environmental controls to mitigate impact, and we think we will have a visual enhancement of the site which will not impact on any adjacent property owners. If anything is, is remiss, we probably have not provided a, a, you know, the, the level of detail to date. So uh, we certainly want to be very transparent in our approach, and we're fully prepared to meet all requirements of the township, both on the engineering side and in terms of the environmental safeguards. Okay. Um, so if there's any questions that, that you might have, um, the applicants are here and their engineering consultants are here and as they say, we would, the request is simply to enable us to move forward and we don't ask for any relaxation in standards. The only thing is that we can't meet that, we haven't met that 80%, but I don't think there's any jurisdiction in the province that uh, has that highest standard. Thank you. I do have some uh, councillors that wish to speak to you. Councillor Richter. Yeah, um, I thank you for letting us yeah. know it's clean, Phil. My question is what type of soil? Is it like a good quality soil that they could, I don't know, grow grapes in or hops or something if they wanted to? Um, it, it, well, it's ex excavated from the, in terms of the evergreen line, it, it would be to, to a large extent uh, gravel uh, material and uh, it would have uh, so, some some element of topsoil. In the end, we would be uh, covering it over and there would be, uh, uh, it would be hydro seeded. And there would be a swale at the edge to, not to trap sediment because one of the, the critical thing I think is we wanna make sure that this is not going to increase turbidity offsite. The bylaw requirement is that the post-development flows would not exceed the pre-development flows. And we're looking at both on the engineering side and the environmental management side that having those uh, done to, to ensure that takes place. Okay. And uh, what about the drainage into the creek at the bottom of the property? Like, how are you going to make sure that the, nothing's draining into there that shouldn't be draining? No, into there? That definitely uh, don't want to. We certainly don't want to see that take place. The, uh, the site would be a minimum. There would be no fill activity within 30 meters of the property line on the north side, and there's an additional distance uh, to, to the creek. So we would be not impacting any of the riparian area at all, and we would certainly want to make sure that, uh, that we do baseline documentation so that, that, that we are, in, in fact, starting off with a clean area, and we do, definitely don't want to impact that in any negative way. The owners are long-standing property owners in the area, and they're just as much protective of the future as, uh, as others. Okay. And my last question, um, you had a map up there that showed the access coming off Fraser Highway, so yes. it's really bypassing um, like the manufactured home park. Yes. So there's really only a few houses I know there was yeah. like 700 ballots mailed out, but it's well, probably only, what, eight houses? There's, 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 there's a very large area of circulation. I'm not certain. It might be as, as large as, you know, a couple of kilometers. But the, the, the intent, uh, you know, so it was a very large circulation. We're trying to minimize it so that uh, 
that we, we don't impact others. And the, that was one of the considerations looking at access routes that we not uh, go through the, the trailer park. The problem with that is part of that pavement is a narrow strip pavement as narrow as five meters. And there is a little, a little hill just to the west of that. So that would be a bit tricky going up and down. And uh, so we think if we stay only on the applicant's land and just cross over 44th, that would minimize impacts on any adjacent property. So you're, you're, you are definitely going to use that. Route? That's the proposal, yes. Okay. Uh, unless you know the township staff, you know, had had other views, but our propos our initiative is we want to minimize that impact on any adjacent property owners and make sure that we're coming in and out of the site off Fraser Highway only on truck routes. Great, thank you, Councilor okay. Fox. Yeah, thank you for coming. I actually visited the site yesterday, and. Uh, Took a first-hand look at it, and uh, I appreciate the access and egress on this, particularly because 44th is pretty, pretty weak pavement. I don't know if it ever really was truly um, done to, to any standard spec. Um, <clears throat> so my question to you is: Are you going to provide the the personal oversight on this particular? No. No. Who no. will be doing that? Mainland. Um, the the the. the, the so people that would be looking after that would be on the engineering side, mainland engineering, and I've also contacted uh, EnviroWest, environmental consultants. Okay, so y your job is just to do the pre-prep and... Yeah, basically looking at the land use, land use issues, and, uh, but, but I wouldn't be involved in the, uh, in the environmental or the engineering side. Yeah, and this is one of, the, one of if not the first application of, of this kind in in the process and and the 80 percent threshold is is uh, pretty substantial there's no question um when we get to alr lands it's it's a different definitely a different uh um scenario this not being alr lands makes you know it's a bit uh, of a an interesting uh, um fact but um uh, you know, of the 765, Councillor Richter alluded to the mobile home park right there and so on and so forth. I think as long as you don't bother them, they're, they're going to be happy. And uh, only getting 6% return and having to get 80% of 6%, um, it's, it's a pretty weak return on, from the neighborhood on that, which I, I take to mean that they really don't have issue with it. So um, I'll be supporting it uh, because I think that it's there's, there's just... It's there's not a lot of issues that came up and negative to it. So good. I have a question. Uh, so the um, am I to assume that the topsoil will be scraped off, the clean fill would be put in, and then you said it would be is it going to be brought back? So you have a layer of topsoil and then hydro hydro seeded. I I think that's uh, I, I need to. They're nodding their heads up and down. I think so. that was intent. Okay. Yes. Just want to make sure it's clear. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. There's no further questions. Thanks. Okay, the next delegation, Mr. Colin Fry. Thank you, Worship, the councillors, for having me here today. I'm here to speak on behalf of uh, Ian and Doreen Newby, uh, who have um, uh, their properties at um, 3428 and 3474 262nd Street. Uh, the matter before you is a non-farm use to the Agricultural Land Commission. And the purpose of the non-farm use, um, it says the properties are currently used uh, by International Movie Services run by Ian and Doreen Newby. Uh, and they use the property, uh, property in part uh, as a storage and staging area for military, uh, military equipment and vehicles. IMS has been operating from the property for over 30 years. Um, uh, primarily from the property at 3428 262 Street. And over that period of time, IMS has uh, developed a, a prominence in the film industry um, and is a leader in providing military and public service uniforms, vehicles, and equipment for the motion picture um, uh, industry and for television. Um, during that period of time, the success of IMS has allowed um, Ian and uh, Doreen Newby to contribute greatly to the um, uh, Township of Langley through the donation of time uh, and their efforts and their equipment 
for a, a variety of events, uh, too many to, to name at this point in time, but uh, I understand that their participation had contributed greatly to the su success of Alder Grove Fair this past weekend. Um, that being said, we're supportive of the township's uh, staff recommendation to forward this to the Land Commission so that we can pursue our dialogue with the Commission to uh, bring the, uh, the land use activity into conformity with the Commission's uh, wishes. Uh, that's all I have. Great. Thank you. I've got some questions from Council. Council Richter. Um, yeah, two questions. So the property has been used for this for 30 years? Yes. Okay, so what prompted this to come forward now? Uh, the only, uh, uh, it, it, the, uh, what started the, the genesis of this was uh, that the newbies were paid a visit um, by a compliance and enforcement officer from the commission. Um, and my experience at the commission has likely been it was as a result of a complaint. And uh, it's the only complaint that we have heard of. Uh, we're not familiar with any complaints registered uh, to the township. Um, the source of the complaint, we don't know. Um, but it was a single complaint, and this dates back to June, se July 17. And as a result of that, the direction was that um, the newbies activities um, were non-compliant with the Agricultural Land Commission Act and to bring it into compliance um, they had two options one was to cease all uh, the activities on the property and, um, and or or to submit a non-farm use application which we did in a timely fashion um, and we got that in and we kept the Land Commission apprised of that uh, of our progress and then it um, it got tied up a bit, and our, our wishes were that uh, at the time you'll know that Lang, the township was having dialogue with the commission with respect to the, uh, the future of, of that, that property and others uh, under the um, Alder Grove Community Plan Amendment. And so we thought that that process should play out before we proceeded because the outcome of that, depending on which way it went, was germane to the, to the client's outcome. And then we also understand that that after the commission's initial decision, there was dialogue continuing, and we further deferred that for the same reason. Um, and once that most recent decision came out in um, April, I believe, um, it was clear that at least at this point in time, um, we had to move forward with the application um, to to seek the uh, commission's com um, concurrence that the activity can continue. And um, if it's, you know, it would be our hope that we can persuade the, the commission to say that this has uh, been undertaken without fanfare. It's been very, very successful. It contributes greatly to the community. It would be a significant loss to the film industry, as it was mentioned earlier in, in the uh, Community Input Task Force. Um, IMS strongly is, is, a, is a member of that and, and contributes greatly to the success of the film industry not only for the township, but for British Columbia and nationally and internationally. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Long. Well, thank you, yes. So um, I, I, I know that the, uh, the, the commission would probably hired some new staff and they were looking on, uh, on Google or something and, and up popped the farm because I don't know if anybody would complain because that property is completely isolated from everybody else. However, however got here, here we are. And I was just curious to know how much of the property is being exempted. I know the report talks about uh, the, the part that, that is going, that is existing there for so many years, but how much of the property is and what happens with the rest of the property that is not being excluded or ask, not excluded, excuse me, asking for a, uh, a non-farm use? Well, the two properties, one property is 3.5 hectares in size and uh, the other property is 2.3 hectares in size. And uh, it's fractionally used, approximately half the property. Is, a little less than half. A little less than half. You know, so then the remainder is still in, in, in agricultural exactly. use. Exactly. Sorry? It's still in agricultural use. I think there's, there's animals grazing there. The there are animals. Uh, the, the, the newbies have uh, allowed um, certain animal owners and people to graze their animals on the property. Um, it will also be, and we have discussed uh, moving forward, if should it go to the commission, uh, the commission will probably be um, interested in, in not only the land use, but the opportunities for 
the use of the residual lands. And I've already had a chat with the, with the newbies with, with respect to potentially forwarding a, a proposal to the commission of a benevolent lease or tenant arrangement for a farmer to, to use the, the, the rest of the land. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Arneson. Yes, thank you for coming today. And um, I'm interested in your explanation of potential mitigation because the net benefit to farming is, I think, what you're just discussing. Uh, so is that something that will be part of the application going forward or is that part of the negotiation strategy? Uh, it's not after today. <laughs> <laughs> well, after today, uh, dealing with the commission will be probably a, a significantly different exercise given their their response to the township's goals and objectives under the uh, uh, community plan amendment. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we believe we can um, raise an issue. Um, it, it is not our intent to try and, you know, greenwash the proposal. It, it is what it is. We're, we're, it, and the activity, you're absolutely correct. I've been to the property many times, and you'd never even know it was there um, unless you went into the back and looked at it. It, it's all uh, neatly arranged. It's in buildings and marshalling yards, and it's all centralized. And you know, in my estimation, no significant harm has come to the property. Should should it be the newbie's wish to uh, to not do it anymore, it's a matter of taking the stuff off, and there's buildings left. To the point on the farming, um, it's an anticipated question that the commission may have. We're not trying to mitig mitigate it. We're not going to try and offer them something as window dressing. We, we want to get the newbies to be in a position to continue with their, their business, which uh, I won't sound like a broken record, but to, to serve the community and as well as to provide employment um, and to keep the uh, film industry vibrant. So we'll, we'll listen to anything. Um, it is as a result of, of a compliance and enforcement action, um, albeit one complaint um that we have to respond to uh, we'll do that and if at the point in time through discussions with the commission they want the newbies to give consideration to farm enhancements or buffering or or whatever we'll put our minds to that then thank you council quality thanks thanks for your uh, presentation today if the newbies um, decided to sell the business or uh, divest themselves of the business would the land um revert back to uh, farm use? Is that something that is a covenant on the land or on the landowners? Uh, well, uh, number one, the newbies have no intent on, on discontinuing. If, if they're permitted to continue, they will like to carry on as a going concern. Um, um, if through the course of, of future decisions they decided that uh, uh, they wanted to sell it as a going concern, fair ball. If they wanted to discontinue it, uh, that's equally fair. It would be nothing more than relocating, in some cases, very substantial pieces of equipment um, and, uh, and, and all the military from the property. And then what would remain is the land as it was uh, with buildings on it that, that could be used for agricultural purposes. Um, you know, perhaps 10 years down from the, the down the road, uh, uh, the commission will come to a meeting of the minds with, with Langley, and Langley's objectives could be fulfilled down the road, then that'll be another option for the newbies. Right, we're talking about like tanks and armored talking, vehicles, and like there's some serious equipment there. Yeah, there is. Right, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, there's no further questions. Thank you very much. All right, so move on to reports to council. Uh, and F1 is, Soil deposit application for property at 234, which do you wish to move, Councillor Fox? Are you moving? Do you want to look at the motion and tell us what you're moving? Hmm? Are you moving that? To support. The okay, well, process. Say that. So we don't have oh, it. sorry. So the council the directs staff to, to process the soil disposition application for property located at 234, 3340th Avenue. Is there a seconder? Councillor Quali seconds discussion on F1. Councilor Richter. Yeah, um, I note in the uh, report that this is the first time we've used this and uh, that uh, basically <coughs> we sent out over 700 um, letters to people around there, but only 20% responded. And uh, 
of the 20%, 67% said yes. So uh, I have a question about whether maybe the baseline is a little too high given the response rate that uh, uh, that we're getting. But I'm, I'm comfortable this is not going to um, negatively impact a lot of area neighbours. I think that uh, it's isolated and I appreciate the fact that uh, some plans have been made to keep the trucks off 44th and away from the uh, manufactured home park. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'm going to call the question on F1. It carries unanimously. Move on to F2, electric vehicle charging requirements. Can I have a motion, please? Councillor Whitmar, second by Councillor Arneson. Uh, discussion? Councillor Arneson? Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just want to say um, through you uh, to staff uh, a note of appreciation for following up on this. We've had quite a few discussions around the council table regarding EV charging stations. And so I think it's going to be um, very interesting to um, consider in the future what number we come up with. Um, I notice that there's a range when we look across Metro in terms of um, what their regulatory policies are with respect to how many they expect. And so I do look forward to a subsequent staff report on, on the options. And I know that uh, we will be looking to have them tailor-made and to be best suited for our community. So thank you. Thank you. See no further discussion. I'll call the question. F2. It carries unanimously. Move on to F3, Agriculture Land Commission Application Number 100334. This is Newby. Uh, could I have a motion, please? Move. Councillor Fox, second. second. Councillor Whitmarsh, discussion on F3. Seeing none, I'll call the question on F3. And it carries with Councillor Arneson opposed. Move on to F4, Agriculture Land Commission Application Number 100304, Alpine and Martin Consultants Limited, Homestar Building Corp. On 72 Ave, could I have a motion, please? Uh, Councillor Whitmarsh, seconder. Councillor Long, discussion on F4. Councillor Richter. Um, yes, I, uh, this is a, a, an unusual piece of property, and I can certainly understand how dividing it uh, might help imp or increase the, uh, the area that is used for farming. But I'm just wondering... Do we need to add something like a farming-only covenant? Um, I thought on page 48, I'm just looking this up now, that there was a, a reference uh, to this um, from, the, uh, from Dave Melanchuk, uh, which he recommended uh, placing a farming-only covenant against the title. So I, I would like to make that amendment if I could. Okay, is there a seconder to that amendment? Councillor Davis seconds it. Uh, discussion on the amendment. Councillor Long. Can I get an explanation perhaps from staff? I mean, it is in the agricultural land reserve, so. It's in a rural is there plan. Something? Oh, well, if I could. Uh, sure, if you want add, to speak to that. The impression I got from Mr. Melanchuk's arguments was that by putting a farming only covenant, you're probably going to um, avoid. Uh, people building estate homes instead of using the land for what it was intended, which is farming. Okay. So long. Do you have something more? Well, I'm just, not, yeah, I'm just wondering if staff can tell us if we have the authority yeah. to do that or not. Your worship registration of a covenant uh, would have to be with the consent of the owner, so council does have the authority to, to make that a uh, an additional notation for the land commission to consider as part of council's referral to them. Thank you, Councillor Arneson. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I do appreciate the amendment because um, my concern is, I know there is language in the report having to do with the fact that um, we can, as a local government, limit where the houses would be, etc. But I'm not necessarily sure that we have the uh, authority uh, to actually mandate that somebody use it for a farm. Um, so I'm actually not going to, I, I support the amendment that if, if there is some kind of covenant that could be put on there so as to restrict um, the usage for farm use, that would be helpful. But overall, I'm not supportive of this application. I think that um, when it was purchased, the person who bought it knew what the conditions were. Um, I don't 
I know there's arguments they are saying that if you broke it down into smaller pieces, it would be more likely to be farm, but I'm, I'm more influenced by the ALC when they talk about keeping larger parcels together. And uh, I understand that there is viability in smaller acreages, but I think there's also viability in larger ones if you put your thinking cap on and your business model really meets what the uh, status of the property is now. So I won't be supporting sending it forward, but I'm in support of the amendment. Thank you. Councillor Whitmarsh. I, yeah, I would say that because this is in the the ALC uh, jurisdiction to determine what happens from an agricultural point of view, I would suggest that we don't need to put in a limitation of farming only. I think that's up to the ALC to make that call. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Any further discussion? I agree with Councillor Whitmarsh. I don't think we can impose on them. It's in the ALR. It's in our rural zone. And then I don't know who's going to enforce the fact that they're farming or not farming and, and what is farming, leaving it fallow, um, I don't know, putting grazing. But I, I don't support it. I think it's in a rural area already. So with that, I'll call the question on the amendment. And that's F4. The amendment fails with Councilor Fox, Councilor Whitmarsh, Mayor Froze, Councilor Quali, Councilor Sparrow, Councilor Long opposed. So we're back to the main motion. Any further discussion on the main motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. And motion carries with Council Richter, Council Arneson, Council Davis opposed. Move on to proposed community amenity contributions policy. And could I have a motion, please? Councillor Sparrow moves, second by Councillor Qualley. Uh, and any discussion on this? Council Arneson. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, well, I, I really want to commend staff for putting this together. I know it's been a long-term discussion about community amenity charges. We've had a lot of dialogue with our development partners, with UDI, etc. And so we've culminated in um, having this proposal being put forward. But I, I do have some questions for Your Worship to, to staff. And so if uh, I can be indulged, I think I'll just rhyme them off and, and see if, what kind of responses I can elicit. Um, my first question is, I didn't see any instance aside from a kind of an escalating clause that they could go up based on uh, cost of living kind of increments in the future. But I'm wondering what opportunity is potentially built in to have us um, change the list of CAC recipients uh, in the future, if that is something that's considered in the policy. Mr. Seffi? Uh, yes, Your Worship. The uh, policy as well as the staff report, actually do discuss and contemplate an annual review. Okay. Uh, that will then uh, not just a review, but also have a automatic increase based on the Vancouver Consumer Price Index built into it. I, I did understand the part about the increase, but not necessarily the part that the actual recipients could be reviewed by a sitting council. We'd have the discretion to be able to do that on an annual basis. Would that be correct? That's correct. Thank you. Um, so my secondary question is um, actually the list. So if you uh, look at page six of the report and you will see the identified preferred list, so the prioritizing of where we'd like to spend the money. So I had a couple of comments about that vis-a-vis uh, -vis the report. So in the report it indicated that there was quite a bit of public feedback in the Willoughby area, particularly having to do with library services. However, there is no reference to libraries being included in the CAC. So I'm wondering, uh, through your worship to Mr. Safey, could they be considered in some way under the recreation heading for consideration? Would that be a possibility? Uh, your worship, that is exactly how staff uh, anticipate this, this item in fact, to include libraries as part of the, the overall scheme of what a recreation facility would consist of. Perfect. So libraries are included. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good news. Thank you. Um, the other question that I had, um, through your worship to Mr. Safey again, um, could you please clarify, because I did not see in that list fire halls as a priority. And so I'm wondering if that is, is something uh, for some reason that I'm not aware of, because I know that they can be considered for CAC funding. Uh, Your Worship, uh, I guess in, in reverse order, yes, they can be considered because of the fact that they're not covered in terms of uh, 
other tools that are available to local governments for, for raising funds. So uh, it, it, they could, uh, but the fact is that as part of the initial analysis that was determined based on council direction to come up with the needs assessment, uh, there was a comprehensive list that was prepared that was then presented to the in industry as well as the public, which then resulted in input that then uh, allowed staff to fine tune that and tweak it and the requirements for fire halls uh, have not been determined to be as, as urgent of a need as, as some of the other uh, needs that have been determined. But further to my earlier question, we could make an amendment if it was determined at some point in the future that we wanted to change the prioritizing. I guess kind of what I'm asking in a way is we have a list of identified priorities. Can we expand those priorities? Uh, Your Worship, the... Uh, as, as, as mentioned earlier, the, the policy does require staff provide council with an update on an annual basis, at which point council can determine if the rates need to be adjusted and for what purpose. So having said that, uh, yes, other items could be added and, and council has the full discretion to, to either take items away or add items to the list. Okay, thank you for that. And my final thought is um, I see that there is a analysis and that 20% of the CACs are currently planned to be earmarked for affordable housing. Um, I'm wondering about that in terms of staff's reference point to um, how it is or how long it would take for those funds to generate enough money and actually to create a predictable number of units within a defined time frame. Is there some other references from across Metro that we could look to? Your Worship, if I understand the question correctly, it is uh, virtually impossible for staff to determine, even based on what activity may be happening in the ju other jurisdictions in the region, as to what affordable housing projects might come forward in the future, if that is the question. Uh, what staff has been able to do is uh, determine what the likely revenue that might be generated as part of the CACs would be, uh, and, and that is estimated currently to be about $5 million a year, 20% of which can go towards affordable housing projects that can come forward. Okay. Um, my primary concern with that is if I look at that as a funding opportunity, the degree to which we are be, being able to work towards having something actually constructed in a reasonable time frame because we're all talking about affordable housing and how important it is. But if I, the cost of housing, uh, construction, land costs, etc., they're going up daily. So I am concerned that a percentage of this $5 million is not going to be satisfactory unless the township, for example, is setting aside some of its own properties in order to contribute to affordable housing. So um, I, I do have some concerns about the 20%. It's not enough for me to not support this. But I, I do think that we need to take... Um, some more uh, an investigatory approach. We have the opportunity now to have a um, housing assessment done. And so I think once we have a clearer idea of what the need is, perhaps we might want to reconsider that. And um, I'm not necessarily saying more of the 20%, that it needs to be 40 or 50%, but we have to find some way in order to get uh, some real critical mass going forward because I, housing is something that is a key component of our community. And unless we're doing something a little more aggressive than what we've been doing before, I just don't see it actually being that successful for the need that we have currently. Thank you, Councillor Sparrow. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this report. I appreciate uh, staff's work on this and uh, the research and um, input that they received during the process. Um, I guess my question um, would be in regards to the actual policy of, of how um, of how it is listed that the the, the list as Councillor Qualley or Councillor sorry Councillor Arneson um, mentions um, why we would sort of handcuff ourselves into actually specifically listing certain. Um, areas or amenities to fund. So, um, you know, township uh, greenways, uh, the, the satellite RCMP detachment, the conference and entertainment center, the recreation center in Willoughby, uh, Recre recreation center in Brookswood. Um, I'm just like having them done my own 
research when we sort of started this process. Um, other communities, uh, from my understanding, didn't specifically list certain projects, and I feel like um, maybe you know even using those as examples of items, um, so there was some clarity on what type of projects we could be looking at funding, but to actually specifically earmark uh, where you would need to go back and make a policy change uh, in order to to change the list seems um, not sort of maybe in, in keeping with what we would want to be uh, able to be fluid in addressing certain things. Like I do think um, there will be that need uh, coming up with the development in Brookswood for uh, the fire uh, and the expansion and the and the fire halls and and to that have not that have. To have had that not listed, I think, is uh, a concern to, to me as well. So I, I just feel like, it, was there a reason why we couldn't leave that open-ended and not actually specifically list certain projects uh, and just leave it as examples? Mr. Seffi? Uh, Your Worship, the, I guess, quick answer is uh, transparency and accountability. I understand the idea, but this list does not, as I said earlier, uh, preclude council uh, through a resolution to direct staff to amend the policy and add things or, or remove things. I understand, again, Councillor Sparrow's comments in terms of maybe other jurisdictions not having a list, per se, but for us to actually start thinking about this, it was important for us to actually determine what the needs in the community are. And as I said earlier, a, a long list was prepared, which was then shortlisted, uh, based on community input, and in order for us to actually come up with a number, uh, we had to actually have a list that we could then assign or, or estimate costs of, which would then be translated into a community amenity contribution uh, policy. But and, and then again, it does not uh, prevent council or handcuff council in terms of uh, potential changes in the future. So, but we would then have to actually amend the policy then to to be making those changes. Uh, Your Worship, yes, it, it would require an amendment to the policy, but it would be simply a re resolution of council as opposed to a, an extensive bylaw pro process, which, again, would be a requirement if staff was to, to be directed to uh, start setting money aside for any project. It would still be the same process, one resolution of council. Okay, okay. Okay, I... I can see. I do. I do appreciate. I think there, this is a starting point, and I think it is addressed and, and mentioned in the policy of us reviewing. And I think that's important, an important part. And I do feel like this is a, a starting point for us to kind of maybe assess and or future councils to assess. Um, um, so I, I guess I sort of having said that, I can understand that. I just would hate for it to feel like it was precluding other items from being looked at uh, with them not making the list. So with that sort of being clear that that is sort of maybe a starting point of maybe the initial needs and that the community and council future councils can address that as as moving forward um, but I, I do think this is a great start I think that it's clear from from the comments that on a, we're expecting you know an estimated five million dollars a year to start with with this I think it's clear that there has been um, money left on the table and I'm excited now that we're going to start collecting that money and seeing some of these projects that in, in uh, past would not have been able to be funded um, this way um, to, to be looking at ways to sort of generate some, some money to, uh, to help with these costs of a growing community um, that are definitely more than just roads and um, you know infrastructure uh, pipes and, and all of that that there are other aspects to a growing community that need to be funded and, and this is certainly a starting point so I appreciate again the work of uh, staff and I look forward to this being implemented Thank you. Council Long well we used to have a perfect system before this came up a couple of years ago and uh, staff would negotiate on, uh, on each case by case basis there was all kinds of contributions being made I don't know if there was any money left on the table the only money that's not on the table anymore is the poor folks that have to buy the homes now that this is all this whole policy has been created and so without being terribly critical I was opposed to the to going down this road to begin with because we did have amenity contributions on a case by case basis and I think the township actually led uh, the region in that respect because we weren't constrained, just as that has been mentioned just recently here uh, by uh, Councilor Sparrow. Now we have this policy by which we've boxed ourselves into, and I can't imagine the amount of work that's gone into it. 
And do we, who wins in the end? I guess it's hard to say, but I, I know who's going to lose. The price of housing is not going to go down as a result of this policy. And I'm not trying to, uh, to put council in a bad light, but really we have to provide affordable housing to our citizens. That's the number one goal of any local government. And a policy like this doesn't really accomplish that, but here we are way down the road, so I can just not support it, but uh, do thank the staff for all the work the council's put you through. And I hope at the end of the day, it, uh, well, it'll be what it'll be, I guess. Thank you. Councilor Whitmarsh. Uh, thanks for the, uh, the this policy. I I, um, I think it's uh, there's some really good work that's gone into this, and um, you know I have some I have some of the concerns about uh, housing uh, prices as well. Um, but I do appreciate that a significant portion of this money is set aside for affordable housing and developing specific projects that relate to that. Um, I, I I'm supportive of the 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 uh, list that is identified here. I think sometimes when you don't have a list, you end up with a lot of different projects on a list, and you end up actually never completing anything. You have just too small amounts of money to submit to any particular project, and nothing really gets done. So I like this. I think it allows us to move forward with some very specific projects and get things done as we know they're moving forward. There's great public input into this, so this is not something that was just developed by staff alone. Um, and so I do think it's uh, good to have the list. Certainly we can add things that at, at a later point, so I'm very supportive of, of the way that it's uh, written here. My, my question that I have uh, uh, through your worship to staff is just around, um, just, just to remind us around the, the uh, housing affordability and how this interacts with DCCs, particularly the increase that we're experiencing in DCCs and how this policy will tie into that and, and connect in a way that uh, doesn't allow or won't force housing prices to be increase in a significant way. Thank you, Your Worship, uh, and, and thank you for the questions. The, uh, one of the things that the industry advised staff of was the need for us to uh, try and, and uh, not encumber, if you, if you will, the, the word usage, encumber the, the, uh, the housing market with uh, many fees at the same time. In other words, try and and straddle the, the cost, the anticipated increase in, in charges uh, going forward. So we have the CACs, and sometime after, and not, not concurrent, have the DCC increases. The industry has always been uh, supportive of, uh, if I can put it that way, of what, whatever the appropriate costs are based on an analysis of of land values, of, of uh, construction costs and labor and material costs, as long as the costs are incremental and, and not imposed at one time. So with that in mind, the intent is for the DCC Bala review to not come into effect for the next uh, at least six months. And at, at, at that point, uh, staff endeavor to bring council, uh, uh, bring forward for council's consideration uh, 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 DCC bylaw that's reflective of the current land values because the current bylaw is actually a few years old now and, and land values have, I think, in some cases have tripled in terms of, uh, in comparison with the, with the land values that have gone into the DCC charges. As far as affordability is concerned, your worship staff can, can advise that this particular policy does not, in fact, even though every increase will have an incremental impact, uh, the fact remains that this, for the most part, is is a minimal, can be considered a minimal increase uh, in terms of, I guess, single family being $5,000, I think, uh, based on my understanding of market these days, I think the price of a single family home is around a $1.2 million range, so $5,000 doesn't really equate in having a, a significant, I guess, impact on the, the, the price of a home. So just just to follow up, then it, it is in here a suggested a, a twelve month uh, a grace period for the introduction of this policy, um, and so is that twelve? That's twelve months from uh, today, or when when would this twelve months start? This grace period before the CACs would take effect. Uh, thank you again. The uh, intent, Your Worship, is if Council was to adopt the policy, that the policy will not come into full force and effect until 12 months from the date of adoption. In other words, July 23rd of 2019 would be the date of, of effectiveness of the policy and the applications that have already been in, in complete or submitted 
and are considered to be in-stream will be exempt as long as they obtain their final reading of, uh, of the uh, you know, corresponding zoning bylaws prior to the July 23rd of 2019. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Qualley. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank staff for this report. It was really um, easy to understand and um, it was um, easy to follow along the process. I'd also really like to commend the staff um, for their work uh, in this, on this report in terms of the engagement process. I know when this first came to the table, the development community was concerned about what this might look like and how it would unfold, and I think our staff did a really great job bringing them along in the process and making sure that everybody was heard and everybody understood. So I think in, the, in terms of our stakeholder engagement process here, I think staff really um, held up them held themselves to a high standard in this so I thank them for that I think this also creates a policy where there's consistency and everybody sort of has a good understanding of the expectations and how they can move forward instead of you know sort of ad hoc or, or random contributions we also have a policy now that supports true affordable housing initiatives through our DCC waivers so uh, while I do have a concern about the impact this will have on housing prices with the increases that are coming in DCCs and TransLink taxes. And there's a whole bunch of things that just seem to be compounding to affect uh, or impact affordability. I think we've taken really good steps to create policy aside from this that would um, take into consideration the need for some DCC waivers or or whatever that could look like for us to support some true affordable housing rather than, you know, like Mr. Seffi said, $5,000 on a single family home. Um, without referring back to the policy, perhaps through you, Mayor Froze, to Mr. Seffi, could you confirm for me that CACs will not be, uh, are not part of our DCC waivers for affordable housing? It's not included in that bylaw, is it? Mr. Seffi? I'm um, sorry, I don't know if I understand the question, Your Worship. Uh, is the question whether CACs, sorry, can I maybe ask Councillor Quali to repeat the, the I'm question? I'm sorry, maybe I wasn't very way. clear. Our bylaw that allows for the waiver of DCCs for non-profit housing, does it also allow for the waiver of CACs? That, that's a separate process, Your Worship. That's a separate bylaw. Uh, the DCC regulations are fairly rigid. So the statutory sort of provincial statutory requirements are for a council, if a council wishes to waive DCCs, to actually have a bylaw and have a DCC waiver bylaw. As far as CACs are concerned, the CAC policy that, that council is, is considering this evening does in fact make reference to the same uh, treatment, if you will, in that the CACs will not be applicable on uh, affordable housing projects. Thank you for clearing that up. But does that require us a separate motion, or is that encapsulated in the this? Re it is included. Thank you yeah. for clearing that up. Sorry for the confusion. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Richter. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to go back to the comment that uh, Councillor Long made with regards to affordable housing, and I think affordable housing includes reasonable tax rates too. So you can pay now or pay later, and keep paying later, and keep paying later. Um, we got today on table a letter from the uh, UDI as well as the Greater Vancouver Home Builders Association that says they are generally supportive of the proposals and their industry has always supported the principle that growth should pay the fair share of the costs associated with growth. I echo that sentiment and uh, I think this is a move towards making that share fairer. Thank you, so Council I will support it. Thank you. Councillor Long. Well, this assumes that there, there has been something going on over the last 20 or 30 years that people are not paying their share. I guess that's an assumption that's being made, first of all. And if you look back at some of the projects, uh, or if council were, or anybody would look back at some of the projects that happened way back in the past, there were much, much higher contributions given to community amenities than this policy allows. If you look at Bedford Landing, for example, where the mayor actually lives, I mean, there's a, a whole uh, record... Um, food center that, that, that we're now leasing out that was given to us as part of an amenity there. If they had stuck to this policy, I guess that wouldn't even be there today. So here we are with the policy, and I won't be supporting it, but I think if we want to keep housing affordable, we don't want to restrict the amount of 
parking and, and the type of parking that we did at the last meeting. We eliminated uh, the potential for uh, certain parking requirements in, in housing. I'm sure that's not going to drop the price of a house. And today we're, well, we've spent an awful lot of time and money and effort in trying to, trying to make something fixed that really wasn't broken before. Thank you. Okay, I'll call the question on F5. It carries with Council Long opposed. Move on to F6, uh, Cedar Creek Estates Manufactured Home Park. There's a motion there. Could I have a second? Moved by Councillor Fox, second by Councillor Whitmarsh. Uh, Councillor Arneson. Yes, thank you, Worship. Um, I do appreciate um, that this has been put forward as a result of a rather challenging situation further to a new OCP and uh, zoning. However, um, I'm not going to be supporting, actually, um, just going back to what was originally proposed. I believe that once we extinguish this attempt to change the zoning to a manufactured home park, we will not easily, if at all, be able to obtain similar lands for a manufactured home park in the area. And overall, our manufactured home park policy, which is included in the staff report, really underlines the importance of maintaining this zoning, or additionally, that any redevelopment of a manufactured home park assures that there is some affordability component in any new development. And I just wanted to share, I, I reached out to somebody who does actually in the business world provide affordable housing. And what um, I'm just going to sort of generically say on what they're talking about for manufactured or mobile home parks. Um, they're actually being looked at to be purchased in order to turn them into rental housing opportunities because there's a critical supply of affordable, lack of affordable housing, and but these opportunities, unfortunately, are in private ownership, and that is the problem that we have here. It's a lack of housing security and under increasing pressure. And the only way to decrease the pressure is to enforce existing zoning and to limit the use to mobile home parks and preserve this in any OCP. So I won't be supporting this. Thank you, Councillor Fox. Well, I will be supporting this <clears throat> because I think this gives some security to some people. I realize that's not a necessarily a perfect solution, but it's a solution to a situation which created a lot of anxiety and a lot of discomfort for its residents. And obviously, through the collaborative approach that was taken, um, the outcome is that we, well, the motion that we have in front of us today. And although it's not perfect, I think that it's a, a more constructive uh, approach than the anxiety-driven uh, angst that was created by the other, um, the previous approach. So I, I will be supporting this. Thank you. Councillor Whitmarsh. I'll be supporting this uh, motion as well. I think that uh, uh, it's clear that uh, now that uh, the residents of that community um, have received the good information and are able to clarify in their own minds uh, what's happening there, it's clear that uh, approximately 90% support leaving the designation uh, as it is. And um, I think we should continue to, to move in that direction, and I will certainly be supporting it. Thank you. Councillor Richter? Yeah, I see that the majority of residents are willing to uh, or sign that petition, but I also see that the property owner has also indicated a willingness to withdraw the rezoning application submitted in March 2018, which kind of put them all up with their backs a bit towards the wall, I think. Now, um, to staff, do we have any guarantees that the property owner will, in fact, withdraw his rezoning application if we drop out of this whole business of the bylaws? Mr. Seffi. Your Worship, we have the commitment of the landowner to uh, not pursue and withdraw the application. And I guess I will take this opportunity to just also... Uh, uh, I guess uh, council is aware of it, but advise the public uh, and remind council perhaps that uh, property owners are, are able to present applications at any time. Uh, in other words, even if this was a requirement of the process going forward, uh, the fact remains that a property owner can submit a new application at any time for, uh, for reconsideration or consideration of council which will then be subject to council's normal process of considering the application on its own merits. So, uh, yeah, that's the, uh, the comments that I would have. Okay, well, I actually uh, agree with Councillor Arneson. I think that uh, 
manufactured home parks and their residents deserve more protections. Thank you. Councilor Qualley. Thanks. When I first read this report, I thought maybe that was a typo, 90%. I didn't think we'd ever get to a place where we had uh, that high of a consensus on uh, any sort of uh, proposal coming from that area. And I'm really glad that we've spent the time um, with some assistance from some outside consulting um, to figure this out and get to a place where the residents have some, some uh, security in their home. And uh, at one point, several months ago, we had a couple hundred seniors in our community who had very little home security. And I think now with this change, we have 90% uh, of them that feel like they have some security in, the, in, their, in their home situation. So I'm definitely gonna be supporting this. And I wanna thank the staff and our consultants and, and the landowner for, um, for persevering to get to this result. Thank you, Councilor Whitmarsh. Yeah, just uh, just a final comment is that uh, there is uh, significant protections uh, for these people. Uh, both we have a township policy around protection for people in mobile home parks and the provincial government has introduced uh, more stringent uh, protection for those in mobile home parks. And so there are significant protections and, and, and uh, the concern about the value of property. In fact, uh, three of those homes in there have sold in the last number of months, certainly indicating that all of the, the, the uh, misinformation that was spread certainly has had no effect on the ability to sell homes in that, in that park. So I think now that people have the clear information, it's, it's, it's quite it's, it, that 90 percent of the people are very happy with the situation they're in. So I think uh, absolutely we should be supporting this. Thank you. Any further discussion? Uh, seeing none, I'll call the question on F6. And it carries with Councillor Richter, Councillor Arneson, Councillor Davis opposed. We move on to correspondence. There's one item of correspondence. We have a motion for receipt. Councillor Qualley, second by Councillor Fox. Discussion on that. Uh, Councillor Arneson. Yes, uh, I know that we don't do proclamations, but I'm hoping that we might uh, correspond with the United Way. I know they have a flag, and perhaps they'd like to fly it high on September 20th. Thank you. I don't know if they've requested that. They haven't requested it, so. Oh. Well, uh, I know they haven't requested it, but in lieu of a proclamation, maybe they'd be interested in doing that instead. That was my only thought. Thank you. All right, without a call of question. A receipt. A receipt. Carries unanimously. And Minister of Committees, there's Agriculture Advisory and Economic Enhancement Committee of June 27th. Can I have a motion, please? No. Councillor Davis, seconder. Councillor Fox, discussion on receipt. Seeing none, call a question on H1. Carries unanimously. Move on to H2, and there's a recommended motion from the AAEEC, and that is regarding uh, reducing particulate matter emissions. Uh, that we be that we sorry, the Metro Vancouver be invited to provide the reducing particulate matter emissions presentation to council, and that council direct staff to work with Metro Vancouver to help create a communication strategy that educates and informs residents in rural and agriculture areas about alternatives to open burning and solutions and best practices and that council direct staff to review open burning windows and timeframes and that council direct staff to work with Metro Vancouver to explore other solutions. Why don't I just say the recommendation? Mm -hmm. and alternatives to open burning and help facilitate their end goal of improving air quality in the region. Do I have a motion, please? <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Davis, second. <laughs> Councillor Richter, well, I guess I hadn't talked much today. I had to you know, get out there. Councillor Arneson. Uh, yes, thank you, Worship. I just want to say I really endorse this. I know that Metro is really going above and beyond. They're taking their mandate uh, to a new level. Overall, air quality is certainly a concern. We all share the air shed, and I know that because we have so much agricultural land, not just that, but uh, our burning practices and best management, I think we need uh, an educational component to help people to recognize that there are some that are very severely impacted by particulate matter in the air, and especially under in inversion situations, uh, we need to be really cognizant of that and try and figure out ways that we can reduce the negative air quality and health impacts while we're doing this. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I'll call the question on H2. It carries with Council Long opposed. Move to H3, and this is a motion to invite KPU for uh, a report. Can I have a motion, Council Arneson, seconder? On H, Councillor Richter, uh, discussion on H3. Looks pretty straightforward. Councillor Richter. 
Yeah, they're um, very close to finalizing their uh, their report, and uh, the uh, committee felt that um, it would be appropriate for them to uh, take it directly to council. It's uh, very informative and uh, certainly will fill in a lot of uh, knowledge gaps for us in terms of what we should be doing for food production as we move forward into the next decades. Thank you. I'll call the question on H3. Carries unanimously, and Councillor Richter, your mic is on. You have a yes. So I'm uh, just moving the motion, which is essentially that uh, we refer the matter of under Eve pot lights um, to staff for a report and recommendations on how to uh, uh, how the excessive use of these pot lights can be regulated as part of the building permits process. I so move. Okay. Is there a seconder? Councillor Arneson seconds. Discussion on I-1. Councillor Arneson. Um, yes, thank you, Your Worship. I know we've received some correspondence um, as well as this notice of motion. Um, and as a result, I started to look into the situation. And I think that there are a number of communities that have started to create policies around this. Uh, generally, they're called dark sky policies. So the protocols that we have in place currently are limited, but they generally reflect our um, strategy to reduce the nuisance light spillover to neighboring properties. Properties. So um, I think that the challenge is that when we have, you know, potentially properties that are developed, and I know LED lighting is a huge benefit from a, um, a cost saving and an energy efficiency point of view, but apparently once they were initiated and there was a broad uptake, it brought more and more of these issues to the fore because more people were using them and brightening up our environment, apparently. So I, I support this going back to staff for review to see what it is that we could do um, to sort of tie it in with our general requirements so that light pollution is not troubling to the neighboring properties. Thank you. Councilor Richter. Yeah, and I had a discussion with a developer uh, this past weekend uh, about why these are becoming more prevalent. I had thought initially that maybe it had to do with security, home security. And the answer that I got was a little bit surprising. It's a trend, and um, the whole purpose of them is to show off the lines of your house. So maybe that's a trend that we don't need to have in this community, but I would like to hear uh, what staff have to say about the matter. Thank you. Well, this doesn't apply to Christmas lights. We're okay. Any other discussion? Seeing none, I'm going to call the question on I-1. Yeah. And the motion carries. Councillor Fox, Mayor Froze, Councillor Qualley, Councillor Sparrow opposed. And is there any other business? Terminate. Second. Moved by Councillor Fox, second by Councillor Davis. Motion to terminate. All those in favour? Opposed. And carried. Thank you.